Well, welcome everyone to our town hall on for Black History Month entitled Black History is History. I'm Dennis Stone from the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice at the Jacksonville Urban League. And uh, just going to turn on my video. Um, we're really excited about this because we have uh, Florida Coastal School of Law Black Law Students Association has joined us in this effort. Uh, in fact, it's really um, their, their effort that really got this off the ground and we're excited about what we're gonna hear about and I won't take away from their, uh, the magic of their presentations by giving it away, but you're, you're really in for a treat. This is something you'll remember for a long time. And uh, I do wanna thank uh, the Jacksonville Urban League, uh, the BALSA, of Florida Coastal, our interns at the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, and all those uh, at the Urban League who are so helpful to us, not only the staff, but also um, uh, President uh, Richard Danford and the uh, many, many, many members of the uh, Jacksonville Urban League Young Professionals and the Jacksonville Urban League Guild are so helpful in uh, the development of these programs. This is part of a series of events and town halls uh, co-sponsored by the National uh, Urban League and the National Football League uh, in their Inspire for Change series. So with that, I will ask uh, uh, Michelle to uh, start the moderation. Uh, Michelle is Vice President of the Black Law Students Association of Florida Coastal School of Law, and most importantly, a former intern at the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, has been a real uh, asset to the center, and we're so appreciative of her work as we are of all of the um, interns. So Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Stone, for that introduction. Sorry, there's Seems to have been a mix up with the um, Zoom link. So there's gonna be a lot of people joining later that are trying to still get in, just a heads up. Um, but yes, as Mr. Stone said, I am a 2L at Florida Coastal. I worked with the center for a while interning as a criminal justice reform coordinator. Um, so yeah, I wanna thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for um, honoring Black, Black History Month towards the end of the month this evening. Uh, we're gonna discuss the evolution and progression of Black History Month and in efforts to acknowledge that black history is American history. And um, I do want to note that we will have a Q&A section towards the end of the event. So if you wanna type your Qs and As in via the Q&A feature, you can do that. However, if you would rather raise your hand at the end um, and ask the question, that's, that's fine as well. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna give it over to Ms. Katharina um, and I will bring up your PowerPoint for you. momentarily. I just want to say I'm so sorry for the craziness, guys. There's been a mix up with the Zoom link and now there's a mix up with the PowerPoints. So I apologize in advance. Okay, Katharina, take, take it away. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we discuss, you know, how 
American, African American history is a part of American history. As Michelle said, I am a 3L at um, Florida Coastal. I'm currently the president of the Black Law Student Association there as well. And tonight I will be giving a brief presentation on COVID-19 and the Confrontation Clause. But before I dive into all the research that surrounds that, I must start by saying that Jacksonville is one of the oldest venues in the district for a federal courthouse. In 1895, the federal structure served as a post office, the home to numerous federal offices and the district court. It was the only building that survived the Great Fire of 1901, which is said to be one of the worst disasters in Florida history and the third largest urban fire in the, U in the US next to the Great Chicago Fire and the 1906 San Francisco Fire. In 1933, the, that building was replaced with an equally ornate building. And in 2003, the construction on the present courthouse was completed. The old courthouse is now being used by the state attorney's office for the Fort Judicial Circuit. The Florida Constitution of 1838 guaranteed the right to trial by jury, but only to free white males. This was a norm for, let's just say, the next 70 years. However, one of the most drastic changes that happened in American jury system was sparked by a case decided right here in Jacksonville, Florida. According to Florida Jury Duty website, in, in 1908, a case was decided by Justice James B. Whitfield that outlawed the blanket exclusion of African-American men on Florida jury panels. Justice Whitfield wrote that every person being tried in a court of justice is entitled to have a jury selected and summoned without illegal discrimination on any char uh, character. However, it wasn't until 1967 that women were allowed to serve as jurors. The reason I touched on the history of jury trials is because COVID-19 happened. And when it happened, it crashed the entire world within a blink of an eye and forcefully sequestered all of us into our homes. But most importantly, it annihilated our most sacred constitutional right, which is the right to trial by jury and the conf confrontation clause provided by the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment of the US Constitution provides in all criminal prosecution, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with witnesses against him. Similarly, in Article 1, Section 16A of the Florida Constitution states that in all criminal prosecution, the accused shall have the right to confront trial at trial adverse witnesses. The emergence of COVID-19, a national pandemic has led the the judicial system to rely on technological advancements to conduct legal proceedings. All over the country, courts have either suspended or conducted trials and other adversarial proceedings via Zoom or other uh, video conferencing software. While virtualizing the trial experience is imperative in public safety, it imposes consequential issues for criminal defendants, especially minorities and those from underrepresented communities. COVID-19 has the potential of undoing decades of strides toward jury diversity. There was a study conducted by Patrick Byers in economics and social scientists. He did a research in Lake and Sarasota, Florida between 2000 and 2010. And that research focused on the impact of racial composition on juries and on uh, conviction rates for white and black defendants. He found that in a white jury, an all white jury convicted black defendants at a rate of 81%, whereas white defendants were only convicted at a rate of 66% by that same jury. The lack of diversity contributes to African-Americans being convicted at 1.25 times more than white defendants. However, that same study showed that jurors, juries with at least one black juror resulted in a 76% percent conviction rate for black defendants and a 77 percent conviction rate for white defendants. It is imperative for us to understand that having a diverse jury is not a get out of jail free card for minority defendants. It is it is merely a right for minority defendants and under in underrepresented communities to have a fair trial among a jury of their similar race and gender peers. Diversity in jury means diversity in viewpoints, experience, and beliefs. However, since COVID-19 began, the jury pool has seen less diversity due to the fact that the virus has, one, disproportionately affected minorities 
and underrepresented community, and also because there is a, a fear of catching the virus, and because there are also other economic and health hardship that attaches to the con contraction of that virus. Additionally, since the suspension of in-person jurors and the implementation of technologic, technological alternatives such as Zoom, the question now becomes whether or not virtual trials should be administered and whether they violate the confrontation clause. Research has shown that video images will and can undercut the ability of attorneys to detect important eliminatory characteristics such as juror bias and impartiality, which is illuminated through each juror's body language, not only individually, but collectively. Virtual trials also limits the defendant's right to effective counsel, unless the court can somehow find a way to afford defendants access to his or her attorney during trial. Remote trials will also eliminate the, the defendant's ability to communicate with their attorneys during trial and to communicate in confidence. Some might argue that we can utilize the private chat feature on Zoom, However, we all know, for those who have studied evidence, that this might lead to some communication being labeled as non-confidential and therefore admissible. In light of everything that I've just said, the question I pose to you all tonight is, in light of the succession and progression of Black history, do you think COVID-19 is or has the potential of causing further damage to minorities' ever so fragile rights when it comes to jury trials? Thank you. Thank you, Katharina. That was awesome. I think that it's so easy to focus on the primary issues going on with COVID that's directly, that you directly see, like health, um, small businesses, economic issues. But I think it's it's more difficult to look deeper um, and to see how the pandemic has the potential to affect our deeply rooted fundamental rights down to those of the jury trial. Um, I find that really interesting. So thank you for shedding light on that issue. Um, and next we're going to move on to Mr. Solomon Crow. Uh, Mr. Crow is a 2L at Florida Coastal and has been a long, long-term colleague and ally of the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. Um, he's going to present a legal article that he wrote at, while interning for the center um, regarding the Jacksonville's Neighborhood Bill of Rights. So take it away, Solomon. Thank you, Michelle. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening to celebrate the amazing history of accomplishments and contributions of the African American communities within this country. While there are many achievements within the African American community to discuss, there are still several challenges and struggles that continue to plague the community development, financial freedom, education, and employment opportunities of African Americans in the United States. These problems originate from the history of systematic racism and inequality inherent still within the country today. Cities all over the country have the opportunity to work to remedy these inequities through first acknowledgement of the problems, inherently within their government and through actually listening to the needs of the people within the communities and through commitment to effective community engagement and creation of enforce creation and enforcement of effective city ordinances that will ensure that policies are actually um, effective in place. Last summer as an intern for the Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice, uh, I conducted research and wrote a legal article. The name of the article is Jacksonville Neighborhood Bill of Rights. Do Jacksonville neighborhoods have a voice in, in city government? This article focuses on the importance of the 1968 Jacksonville Consolidation and the establishment of the Jacksonville Neighborhood Bill of Rights. So I'm going to first start the discussion of this article by talking about the 1968 
Jacksonville consolidation. So Jacksonville decided in 1968 that in order to be effective in government, um, in, in order to effectively help communities and enforce policies, that consolidation was important um, for that to happen. So the 1968 Jacksonville consolidation created a strong mayor council system. And this system allowed the mayor of Jacksonville to have veto power on all resolutions and ordinances passed by the city council. It also gave the mayor the opportunity to form the city budget and appoint and dismiss leaders of, city, of all city departments. Now, there were many benefits and disadvantages that I saw through research. Um, and one of the biggest advantages of uh, the consolidation was the economic development that it created within Jacksonville. Um, Jacksonville has seen a boost in economic growth since consolidation from Acosta, Baptist Health, CSX, FIS, Florida Blue, companies like Black Knight, and other large companies that are incorporated within the, Jacks within the Jacksonville area. Now, prior to consolidation, one of the disadvantages was that COJ, the city of Jacksonville, and Duval County departments acted on their own separate agendas. So this created a duplication and overlap of many, of many services and ultimately just led to a waste of valuable resources. Um, and as a result of the consolidation, all of those resources that at first were really wasted or just not used in a proper manner were uh, all allocated together um, to enhance efficiency and capability of the city. Um, while consolidation has improved the resource base of Jacksonville, the allocation of funds to help communities has not been distributed fairly and has put many communities at a disadvantage. Uh, namely, Northwest Jacksonville, which is a majority African American community. Uh, this community continues to suffer from a lack of basic improvements of roads, water and sewer lines, um, drainage systems, and street lights. Um, and on top of that, just from looking at the demographics of Jacksonville, African Americans make up 30% of uh, Jacksonville's population, but consistently have higher rates of poverty than other races and ethnicities within the city and higher rates of crime, fractured education systems and housing issues. All of this is still relevant today. Um, the city of Jacksonville has attempted for years to create programs like the Jacksonville Journey, which was a program put in place to help uh, crime prevention, increase community engagement, uh, education systems and the like. And the, you know, some of these programs did actually help in some ways those communities that were in need. But the problem was they, many of them just died out or were folded into other uh, city projects because they lacked the funding to stay afloat for themselves. Uh, commissions, you know, were even produced to attempt to help figure out what communities need, what, what proposals can be made. And those proposals were great, but proposals can only be effective if they're actually acted upon. And unfortunately, many of them fell on deaf ears. Um, the city has placed a lot of money into trying to fix these issues, but you can throw money at a problem, but if you don't really understand or go within these communities and ask the people what the issues are, you know, lots of this stuff just doesn't get fixed or money just gets wasted. And there have been millions of dollars that have been wasted on, on ineffective uh, engagements 
within these communities. Uh, the best way for the city of Jacksonville to help improve these communities is improve the transparency and the communication and the engagement, um, not just in certain, you know, South Jacksonville, East side of Jacksonville, but all of the neighborhoods of Jacksonville, including the Northwest side. And so because the consolidation of Jacksonville led to such a strong mayor system, proposals can go to the mayor's office, but at the end of the day, the mayor's office has the last say about what budgets are passed, what policies are uh, and implemented, and what direction the city is going to go in. And so to try to help to uh, to try to help to build that community input and engagement, the city of Jacksonville um, created a city ordinance called the Jacksonville Neighborhood Bill of Rights. And it was created in 1995. Now this city ordinance contains many benefits um, for citizens of Jacksonville, including establishing namely obligations to the city of Jacksonville for immediate communication and engagement to uh, citizens. Uh, the Jacksonville Neighborhood Bill of Rights declares that every officially recognized neighborhood of the city has the right to expect and receive notifications about any city actions. Uh, the notifications expected from city officials, employees, agencies are of the following prompt and courteous informed responses to all questions regarding city business, advanced notification of any city related public works or utility projects taken place within any adjacent neighborhood, notification of submission and to any application or any type of land use or rezoning, formal input about the annual city budget, including opportunities to express preferred city government priorities, a timely personal response of its district council person or that council person's aid about any questions directed to the city council, and an opportunity to participate in the designs of publicly funded projects. Now, the question that after researching all of this, the question that really just comes to mind at the end of the article is, does the city of Jacksonville enforce the Neighborhood Bill of Rights? Now, any ordinance can only be effective if it's actually enforced. And while the city of Jacksonville claims to value community input on city objectives, local government, um, the local government just hasn't honored, fully honored its obligations to enforce the Neighborhood Bill of Rights. Uh, rather, the city has found ways to consistently circumvent the obligations of the public. And one prime example of this is uh, the avoidance of communication and obligations through other city ordinances. Now, one of the other city ordinances that I found was Section 653.1. 130C of the Jacksonville Code of Ordinances. And it states, the failure of the neighborhood or neighborhood organization, CPAC or other organization were required to notify under section, uh, under this section shall not invalidate or otherwise have effect upon a policy hearing or action taken by the committee or the council of the application for rezoning. You know, pretty much this states that, yes, we know we're supposed to notify you about what's going on in your neighborhoods. But if for whatever reason we don't, whatever we're doing stands. So that's pretty much another ordinance that was put in pla place that is actually being enforced versus the ordinance that was created in 1995 that you know 
is pick and choose about what what's going to what we're going to communicate about and what we're not going to communicate about. And you know, not to say that the city hasn't fulfilled some of its obligations. It has. There's there's council men and women who work hard every day to try to connect with their communities. But a lot of commun other communities and a lot of other neighborhoods are not hearing anything from their neighborhood associations, not hearing anything from the CPACs that are supposed to be um, active within their communities. And at the end of the day, you know, that's what counts. Community engagement means engagement with everybody in the community. Um, the Jacksonville Bill of Rights is an essential ordinance for every citizen of Jacksonville to be aware of. Too many un underserved communities within Jacksonville continue to go unheard and unspoken for. The majority of the communities affected are African American communities and have suffered through decades of lackluster support and development. The city has even stated that it has unfulfilled promises that it wants moving forward to remedy, but words can only mean so much. It's been, it, this will now be the, I believe, 50th, 50th anniversary of the consolidation and Still, the purpose for why it was made uh, to try to strengthen government, not for government self-interest, but for the people has not happened. Not saying that nothing for the people has happened, but everything that is stated within the ordinance that the city itself produced is not being abided by. Our communities deserve assurance that concerns will be heard and acknowledged. Our community deserves confidence in a transparent communication with the city government. The only rational way to materialize this attainable and orderly state of affairs is if the city of Jacksonville honors and enforces its obligations within the neighborhood bill of rights. The resolution to inequity starts with equal opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Solomon, that was really moving. And I think that outside of just the Jacksonville Neighborhood Bill of Rights that was you know, written into law, I think there's a lot of proposed bills as well that go overlooked just because the general public don't have an in-depth understanding of the potential benefit that they could bring. Um, Thank you, Solomon. And that's gonna bring us lastly to Dr. Bartley. Um, he's gonna give us a deep dive back into time through Jacksonville's long, long, long um, African-American history. Dr. Bartley is a Jacksonville native who received his bachelor's in history and political science, his master's in history and his PhD in history, specializing in African-American and urban history from Florida State University. Um, he's the author of more than 18 articles as well as he's presented his professional papers at more than 45 conferences as well. And he's the author of three books and several chapters and many other books as well. Um, Keeping the Faith, which was published in 2000, that's race and political and social development in Jacksonville specifically. And then he also published Akron's Black Heritage, as well as In No Ways Tired, the NAACP's struggle to integrate Duval County public schools. Um, Finally, in 2006, he created the Pan-African Studies Program at Clemson University. And now he's a professor in African-American and urban history at Clemson as well, and the vice chair of the South Carolina African-American Heritage Commission, as well as president of the South Conference of African-American Studies Incorporated. I aspire to have a bio that is that long. I mean, I just, I can't believe it. Okay. Um, Mr. Bartley, I'm gonna give you the floor. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I want to thank the other two presenters. Uh, you, you set a very high bar for me to try and keep up with, but I really enjoyed your presentations. I want to, you know, Black History Month, I've been doing quite a bit this month through Black History Month, and sort of a theme of 
of almost all of my talks has been Black Stories Matter. Uh, you know, we've been doing Black Lives Matter, but I think Black Stories Matter also. And a lot of things that people don't know that they ought to know. And particularly if you're from Jacksonville, you should be really proud to be from a city like Jacksonville. Uh, I know I am. It, is, it, it has a very strong history. But I want to uh, start out with uh, two poems from two of my favorite authors. The first one is a Jacksonville native, James Walton Johnson. James Walton Johnson asked the question, how would you have us as we are or sinking neath the load we bear, our eyes fixed forward on a star or gazing empty at despair, rising or falling, men or things, with dragging pace or footsteps flee, strong willing sinews in your wings or tightening chains about your feet. And my other poem that I, I like to use when I speak is another one of my favorite uh, poets, at least he was, he's not really known as a poet, but one of the favorite poems, famous poems that he wrote is titled God's Minute. I only have a minute, just 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I didn't choose it, but I know that I must use it. Give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny little minute but eternity is in it. And that's how I look at life. You only have a little while to make a, a difference in, in, in life and make a difference on the world. And there have been so many African-Americans from Jacksonville who have made a difference on the world. I'll never forget in 1994, I was a newly or not even finished with my PhD from Florida State. I went to San Francisco and I was a graduate student, didn't have two nickels to, to rub together. But I got a chance to sit down and have lunch with the grandfather of African-American history. You know, the father of African-American history is uh, Carter G. Woodson, who in 1926 decided to have a week to celebrate the accomplishment of African-Americans and called the Negro History Week. But I got to meet the grandfather and that, that was John Hope Franklin. And I was talking to John Hope Franklin. I was a graduate student at Florida State. I was surprised he was willing to have lunch with me there in San Francisco. And I told him I was from Jacksonville, Florida. And he said, wow, there, Jacksonville, there must be something special about Jacksonville because so many special people in black history have either been in Jacksonville or are from Jacksonville. And it, it, it really made me proud to know. And I want to talk just for a little bit about Jacksonville's history and a little bit about some of the people that everybody in Jacksonville should know because their stories really matter because they didn't just impact the city of Jacksonville, but they in impacted the world, impacted the state. And I want, want to start out by thinking about Jacksonville, how Jacksonville, Jacksonville was one of the largest cities in the state of Florida. Uh, do, after the Civil War ended, because there were several union occupations of Jacksonville, particularly by African-American soldiers, Jacksonville became a center of Union soldier activity, particularly African-American soldiers. And African-Americans found a niche in Jacksonville and they, they played a, 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 an important role, particularly during the reconstruction period. We had a black sheriff, we had a number of African-Americans who participated in government and they demonstrated the fact that African-Americans could handle freedom, which was a, one of the questions that a lot of people had after the Civil War, could African-Americans ha handle freedom? As you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but ironically, there was a yellow fever epidemic, which caused many whites in the city of Jacksonville to flee the city. And as a result, Jacksonville became a majority black city during the 1880s, 18, during the 1880s and remained the majority black city for quite a long time. And so African-Americans were able to uh, ex exercise a significant amount of power and do a significant amount of things in the city of Jacksonville. Jacksonville was known as a place where tourists came down, particularly a lot of tourists, northern tourists came down as snowbirds that we have still in Florida. And oftentimes they would interact with the African-American community, which leads me to one of the first people that everyone should know. And one of the persons that I just read the poem from, James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson is, should be a hero to anyone who's from Jacksonville. He's a young man who grew up in the city of Jacksonville. His mother was a school teacher. His father worked as, as, uh, in one of the hotels and his father was brilliant enough as these wealthy whites would come down during the summer, they would read books on trains 
And when they were finished with the trains, they discard them. Well, he would take those books and take them to his sons. And he said, these are the things that wealthy whites are reading. You need to read them so you will know what they know. And as a result, he got a first class education. His brother, uh, Rosemont Johnson, he should be known also. He was one of the premier musicians during the early 20th century. In fact, when people, well, I'm gonna talk about that a little later. So James Walter Johnson gets his premier education. He graduates from a Atlanta University, then gets a master's degree from Columbia. And then he goes out, he and his brother go out and they, they, they perform for a number of years. And then he gets the uh, privilege of being basically the United States ambassador to Venezuela for a number of years. And then the thing that he should most be known for was when he took over the NAACP, he was smart enough to know that the real struggle for civil rights is in the South. And he transformed the NAACP into an organization that went into the South to fight for civil rights. And as leader of the NAACP, he transformed the organization. And most of the branches of the NAACP that you see in the South are the result of James Weldon Johnson's efforts to bring the civil rights fight, fight to the South. We all also should know the fact that he wrote what became the Negro National Anthem when Booker T. Washington came to the city uh, to celebrate uh, African Americans uh, 50 years out of slavery. Booker Washington came, he came, he uh, did a tour and did this educational tour. He was celebrating at uh, Stanton School, Stanton Normal School where James Weldon Johnson was the principal. James Weldon Johnson wrote a poem. His brother liked the poem. They turned the poem into a song and it has now evolved into what they call the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. He is one of the premier of people in African-American history and he's a Jacksonville native. His biography was, it to me, oh, it's autobiography, to me it's one of the better autobiographies because he could criticize himself and recognize the mistakes he made and he doesn't sugarcoat the mistakes he made. It's tragic that he dies in 1938 uh, in a tragic automobile accident where his wife is driving, he's tired. And during that period, they did not have the gates over on, on train track and his car is hit and he passes. His wife doesn't uh, have a scratch, but he was one of the premier African-American figures in American history. And everybody from Jacksonville should know James Weldon Johnson. I want to talk about a couple of other people that, that everyone should also know. James Wilson Johnson set Jacksonville up and is an internationally known figure, but another figure who's not from Jacksonville, but he was, he was incubated in Jacksonville is A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph's father was a minister. A. Philip Randolph came to Jacksonville. A. Philip Randolph was the premier African-American labor activist of the early 20th century. When you think about the March on Washington, we would not have had the March on Washington if it had not been for A. Philip Randolph. Here's a man who spent his life fighting for African-Americans to have equal rights as far as economics are concerned. In 1942, he, he, in 1941, he pressured the United States government to pass an uh, equal pay legislation so that African-Americans could get equal pay if, you, if a company had a government contract. He threatened to march on Washington and threatened to bring 100,000 African Americans to Washington, D.C., so that he could protest, so that they could protest the fact that African Americans were not being paid equal wages. And as a result, he got Congress to pass, he got the president to issue an executive order, the second most important executive order ever issued by a president, guaranteeing equal pay for African, for African Americans if they worked in the military industry, and if the company had a government contract. And not only that, they set up a policing agency for that. A. Philip Randolph then, in the 1960s, he organized the March on Washington, where we got the famous Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech. He is someone that everyone should know. He's a, he was a founding member of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids, one of the first successful Black uh, labor organizations. It was an organization that helped a lot of talented African-Americans find their way and into good jobs. He led a strike against the Pullman Company, which eventually led to the Pullman Company 
dramatically increasing wages and opportunities and also conditions for African-American Pullman in the United States. So A. Philip Randolph is another figure that everyone should know because he had such an important impact on the African-American community. But let's think locally. What should our kids know in Jacksonville? If you graduated from Jacksonville, went to high school in Jacksonville, what should you know the people that, are, that cre help create the city and help change the city? And let's talk about a few of them. One of the things that is most impressive to me is that the number of opportunities that Jacksonville afforded African-Americans. It was a city unlike other cities in that it had a university, it had one of Florida's first high schools at that normal school. It had something else that other communities could only dream of, and that was a resort for African-Americans. And so when you talk about Jacksonville and talk about some of the important people of Jacksonville, the Afro-American Life Insurance Company was one of the top black businesses in the United States. And the man who ran the Afro-American Life Insurance Company, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, should be considered a hero if you like business. Abraham Lincoln Lewis had a dream of bringing insurance on taking this insurance company and taking it to the next level. And he expanded, not only did he do a, a fantastic job with this insurance company, but he bought property and set up a beach, a resort for African-Americans called American Beach. When you study African-American history, you know that most beaches were off limit to African-Americans. They had no way to enjoy beaches and those type of things. Well, A.L. Lewis had the foresight to set up a resort area so that African-Americans could spend time relaxing. It had cabins, it had beach access. And as a kid, if you grew up in Jacksonville, particularly in the 70s and, and, and earlier period, you know that they had race. You could race your car along the American beach and had barbecues and other things. So A.L. Lewis is another figure that if you grew up in Jacksonville, you should know about because he had a tremendous impact in creating jobs and economic opportunities in Jacksonville. Then there were several other people that, that, that people should know about. I want to talk about Frank Hampton for a little while. Frank Hampton was a police officer in Jacksonville, Florida, but he also was an avid golf player. And he was determined to play golf on Jacksonville's golf courses. Now, early on, they reserved certain days for African-Americans to play golf on. But he had the foresight to say, if we're paying taxes for these golf courses, we ought to be able to play when everybody else plays. And so using another person that everybody should know, a lawyer, African-American lawyer named Ernest Jackson, he sued to integrate the city parks. And as a result of his suit, he was able to increase access to city parks and other city functions in the African-American community. Frank Hampton is someone that Jacksonville should should honor because he did a lot of things that were good for the city of Jacksonville. Think about something else about Jacksonville that if you study African-American communities, that they are, that's just unbelievable. Jacksonville for a while had two African-American newspapers. In 1934, Portia Taylor started the Florida Tattler. The Florida Tattler was mainly a, a, you know, a, a magazine or a newspaper that dealt in gossip and other things, but you got news from the Florida Tattler. And Portia Taylor was not only uh, an editor, but he was also active in politics and did other things. And so Portia Taylor and the Florida Tattler was a very important piece of journalism, particularly in the South. Keep in mind, most newspapers did not publish African-American births, deaths, or other news. And so for African-Americans to have the Florida Tattler, a place where you can uh, give your news, get your news, and also announce, get your announcements out was an important uh, thing for people, particularly in the South. Very few Southern cities had it. But then we had another newspaper, Eric Simpson, who is one of the most incredible men I've ever met. Eric Simpson, he also opened a newspaper called the Florida Star. And the Florida Star dedicated more towards news it gave you the business of what was happening in Jacksonville. And so when you are a researcher in Jacksonville, you have the advantage of having two African-American sources to uh, dig into and to draw information from. Eric Simpson was very active in the political scene and he helped uh, advertise African-Americans who were running for politics. He also helped, helped uh, advertise social events and other things that were going on. But what was most important to me he gave Jacksonville a critical eye to protesting 
and also uh, talking about issues that were important for the city of Jacksonville, keeping the African-American community informed. Imagine having two newspapers when most communities did not have one. Then you want, if you also want to talk about important people in Jacksonville's history, what about Ursa White? Ursa White is someone who the world should know about. She was one of the philanthropists, but not only that, she was a political activist trying to register women to vote as early as the 1930s. She was very active in politics, very active in, in, in uh, social work, in the social work movement, very active in helping African-Americans and other uh, disadvantaged people gain opportunities. Ursa White is a jewel, and it's, I'm just impressed to know that she's part of Jacksonville store. Then there are other people that also deserve a lot of credit who also came through Jacksonville or were part of Jacksonville store. We lost a major sports figure just a little while ago in Hank Aaron. Most people don't know Hank Aaron was one of the people who integrated minor league baseball. And Hank Aaron got his start here in this, it got his start there in Jacksonville, playing for the Jacksonville Braves. He led the, uh, the uh, minor leagues in home runs. If you want to talk about hammering Hank, it started in Jacksonville. He dealt with a lot of racism, a lot of problems in Jacksonville. Jacksonville wasn't quite as progressive back then, but it allowed him the opportunity to develop his skills and become one of the stars in baseball. Hank Aaron, talk about Marion Anderson, one of the great singers of all time. People don't know that Jacksonville was a place that integrated concerts, the first integrated concert in the South, really in the state of Florida, since Reconstruction was in Jacksonville. When Mary Anderson refused to sing to a segregated audience, they integrated the audience and allowed her to have a concert. So there's so much about Jacksonville's history that kids need to know. But then it goes deeper than that. Talk about the civil rights era. When you talk about a lawyer with the significance and clout of someone like Earl Johnson, Earl Johnson is, there should be a monument to Earl Johnson somewhere in the state of Florida because what he did for the state of Florida. Earl Johnson was the lawyer of note who integrated most of the school districts in the state of Florida. He filed most of the suits. He was a very strong and powerful advocate of the end for the NAACP. Earl Johnson, his partner, Leander Shaw, was the first African American to serve on the, United, on the Florida State Supreme Court. And he also lived in Jacksonville. But then let's talk, let's talk more about Earl Johnson. Earl Johnson filed the suit in 1960, which started the process of integrating Jacksonville schools. His wife was a school teacher at the time, and he took a big chance by filing that suit. Nevertheless, he thought it was more important that he do what was right than to protect his wife's job, which I think makes him a hero. But he was deep, much, much greater than that. When Martin Luther King was, ar was arrested in St. Augustine and everybody was afraid that Martin Luther King was going to be murdered in St. Augustine. In fact, if you read Martin Luther King's writings, he said he was never as scared as he was when he was in St. Augustine that he was gonna be murdered. Well, it was Earl Johnson who defended Martin Luther King and Earl Johnson is the one that convinced the courts to bring Martin Luther King to Jacksonville and keep him in Jacksonville so that he could be saved. Earl Johnson is a jewel. Then we talked uh, earlier, Solomon talked about uh, city county consolidation. It was a very, very controversial issue in the black community. It was Earl Johnson who convinced African Americans to support city county consolidation because he argued that Jacksonville's African American community would get more than they would lose if they moved towards city county consolidation. Now he didn't have all the facts that later would come become evident, things will see what happened in Atlanta and other things, but he really did not believe that business investment and other things would come to a city that was dominated by African-Americans. But city, consol city county consolidation, it was, there were some things that were good for, about it, some things that were bad about it, but he was the person who pushed it through and convinced the African-American community to support city county consolidation. And he was the first African-American to be president of the city council which is another major uh, uh, move and major accomplishment for an African-American. So Earl Johnson should be someone that we should, every student who graduates from schools in Jacksonville should know.
whether it's from Jacksonville or anywhere in the state of Florida, because of the significant role he played. But let's talk about another significant player in, in the civil rights movement who's from Jacksonville, and that is Rutledge Pearson. Rutledge Pearson is someone who deserves a well-written biography on, and one day I'm going to do it. Rutledge Pearson was a singer. He was a baseball player. He was a tremendous figure. He'd be the kind of person that you would hate to have at your high school because he would get all the honors. He was a tremendously talented person. He was the person who wanted to integrate minor league baseball in the city of Jacksonville, but instead the city closed the parks instead of allowing him to integrate when he was going to play for the Jacksonville Seabirds. He then turned his talents to being a school teacher where he was a very successful uh, baseball coach, but more importantly, he inspired youth in Jacksonville to push to make a better Jacksonville. As president of, of the NAACP in Jacksonville, he was able to transform the NAACP in a very into a very powerful force to fight for civil rights. He incubated a number of young people, uh, people like Rodney Hurst uh, and others who took on the fight of integrating the, uh, the city of Jacksonville and bringing equality to the city of Jacksonville. When you read about these young students who did sit-ins and marches during the 1960s, the courage that it took to do the things that they did. One of the things that was most important about Rutledge Pearson was when Martin Luther King wanted to come to Jacksonville, he wanted to come to Jacksonville instead of St. Augustine, Rutledge Pearson wrote him and said, look, we don't need you, I got this. And he was able to fight the civil rights movement himself without bringing Dr. King in. So Rutledge Pearson was, was very impressive. He fought for African-American civil rights. And as leader of the Florida NAACP, he expanded the role and the power of the NAACP. The reason that Jacksonville did not have uh, the uh, ministerial uh, program that other people had is because Rutledge Pearson got ministers to work with him and he, they were able to become a very powerful force in pushing integration in the city of Jacksonville. Finding some very powerful political entities, he was able to do things that other people were not able to do. And so Rutledge Pearson is another person that everyone should know. I mentioned Rodney Hurt and the work he did as a young man before he went to the Air Force. There were others that also should be known. Alton Yates. Alton Yates is a person that people should know as a school teacher and particularly his, his, the things he did in the Air Force and other things. Those are people that, those are things that people should know. Now, they're also, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention some of the women, some more women, because Jacksonville has been blessed with a lot of very talented women who have done a lot of important things. And I think two of the women who every child who graduates from a school in the Duval County should know about. One is Willie Dennis. Willie Dennis as leader of the NAACP was determined to make sure that every African-American kid got the same education that everyone else got. And as leader of the NAACP, she pushed the fight for years, fighting the school board, trying to make sure that African-American kids got an equal education with everyone else. Willie Dennis is someone that, that we really need to uh, admonish and we ne really need to honor more because of the hard work that she put in as leader of the NAACP. And then of course, there are other women that, that, that I wanted to talk about also. Sally, Math Sally Mathis and Mary Singleton. It is interesting to me that after years of African-Americans fighting, trying to get elected to office with a bunch of very talented and very ta uh, talented and very smart men, it was two women who got elected in 1967 to city council in Jacksonville, Sally Mathis and uh, Mary Singleton. And those were two of the most impressive young ladies that you could meet. They were very smart. They were very good at their job. And they're two people that everyone should know about. But I want to talk about the foundation of getting African-Americans elected. Someone like Elsie Lucas. Elsie Lucas, in the 1940s, he helped register 18,000 African-Americans to vote, trying to get Claude Pepper elected to Congress. He was the one who mobilized the political power of African-Americans in Jacksonville. He ran for city councilman. And after he lost, 
recognized that the system was not designed for African Americans to get elected, he then became a kingmaker, helping to choose people who would run, who would be successful. L.C. Lucas is another person that everyone in Jacksonville should, should know. When he died in 19, uh, 1997, we really lost a treasure because he was a treasure trove of information. He was a treasure trove of information, and Eric Simpson was a treasure trove of, it, of information. When you talk about uh, other Americans uh, incredible things that are that are you know associated with Jacksonville, the list can go on and on and on. But the point that I want you to understand is these black stories matter, and our children should know these people and they should know their stories. When you say you are from Jacksonville, Florida, there should be a sense of pride. Think about it. the fastest man in the world at one point was from Jacksonville, Florida. He transformed the NFL because he had so much speed that they'd never seen. A man who got, who got a, he only got a silver medal in the Olympics, but Jacksonville had one of the fastest men in the world. When you talk about that, the sports in Jacksonville, Jacksonville has such a long and tremendously uh, gifted history of sports figures that it's just unbelievable. And then when you talk about literature, you're not going to get a better poet than James Weldon Johnson. He set up the Harlem Renaissance. And think about it, Jacksonville, this is someone who's part of Jacksonville's story. Then I, as I mentioned, Portia Taylor and Eric Simpson, the way they, they had those newspapers. It is just amazing to me the amount of talent that has gone through Jacksonville. But then there, I want to talk about one other woman who was educated in Jacksonville, and that's Ms. Zora Neale Hurston. In Eatonville, they celebrate her each year. But what they don't talk about is that she got her, her secondary education here in, in, here in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville put as much of a stamp on her as Eatonville did. And Zora Neale Hurston is one of the most talented writers of the 20th century. And so my point with this lecture, and I don't want to go too far, too deep or too long, uh, because I know there's, there's probably going to be some questions, but I really do think that when we teach our kids American history, we should teach them that these stories of these powerful and successful and hardworking working African Americans are stories that matter, and they should know these stories. When you talk about Willie, I talked about Willie Dennis, but also Mary Ann Pearson. Those were two of the first women to work for the city. They worked in the library. There are a lot of stories about Jacksonville that our kids should know because they, they inspire you to know that Jacksonville has the potential to be one of the great places, but we have to all be part of making that fabric into a nice quilt. And I'm going to let them in my little talk, and I can go on and on and on. I'm a historian, but uh, as uh, you know, J Lo told all of her husbands, I'm not gonna keep you long. So I'll open up the questions after that. Thank you so much, Suzanne. How are you gonna end with that, Dr. Bartley? I don't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, that was that was that was such an educational presentation. I thank you. Um, I had no idea. I mean, the majority of that, I'm not gonna act like I did, but the first integrated concert, like crazy. Also, I'm all for getting a statue of like Earl Johnson and Rutledge Pearson and everything. We should, we should work on that. Um, to our audience, I really hope that these three presentations have sparked some kind of thought provoking conversation. Um, and at this time, I wanna open the floor to, for those to share those thoughts. Um, to share your questions, whether those are previously submitted by the Q&A um, tab, or if you want to raise your hand feature if it's there um, and ask, you're open to do that as well. So I'm gonna give the floor to Ms. Kaziah, who's gonna take the questions and um, you can take it away. Uh, so we do have one, or we have two questions from um, an audience member named Charla McClevey. Uh, the first question is to Solomon and Dr. Bartley, and um, Charla asks, do you have any ideas for how CPACs could better engage the community members they represent? Professor Bartley, I'll let you take the floor first, if you'd like. <laughs> uh, you know, 
one of the things I think is what you're, what, what's happening tonight, education, the real problem that most people have is not that they don't, they don't, uh, they don't do better, is that they don't know to do better. And I think that once you begin to fill in the rest of these stories, I think people begin to recognize that there's always more to the story than what they get. And so I think that anytime you have a chance to educate people and break down the ignorance, and I use that term pejoratively, I think you, you have to be more effective in engaging the community and, and, and motivating community and also uh, getting the community ready to do things. And so I think that things like this, where anytime you get an opportunity to break down stereotypes or to fix uh, misconceptions, I think that's what is most important if you're talking about community building. To go off of Professor Bartley, it all, it all comes down to communication. So the way we start to communicate more first is by gaining the education, gaining the knowledge needed um, to understand how the government runs, to understand what laws and what rights you really do have within your community. Um, and just from the discussion I had about the Neighborhood Bill of Rights, I mean, prior to me researching it uh, last summer, I didn't know that 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 was an obligation of the city um, to be able to, well, to be obligated to communicate to every neighborhood and let you know exactly what's going on, when it's going on and get your say in it. Uh, and a lot of people don't. So it really starts first with ed trying to educate the community about the benefits that are there for them because there are many benefits to consolidation uh, just like there are some disadvantages. So it comes down to first education and then communication. And once you're able to do both of those and you're able to get more people to understand about what powers they have as citizens, we as citizens of Jacksonville and as citizens of any, any state uh, have the power to get things moving in the direction we want to. Great, thank you so much for those answers. Um, and then Charla sent in another question, um, and this is to the whole panel. She asks, um, are there any changes that can be made to the city charter to ensure underserved, uh, or to ensure underserved communities get appropriate funding? Uh, who, who's that question for specifically? <laughs> She said it was just to the whole panel. Katharina, you want to chime in or? Um, I think I would defer that to Dr. Bartley when it comes to Jacksonville's funding. <laughs> uh, you want to, uh, you want, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Sorry, the question is, are there any changes that can be made to the city charter to ensure underserved communities get appropriate funding? There, there's always opportunity to change the charter. Uh, the question is, is there the political will to change the charter? Uh, you know, things don't happen by accident. I, that's the one thing I know about in, in studying history. Things don't happen by accident. Things are generally set up to be the way they are. And so if, there's, if there is a, a movement, if there is a, a, a desire to change the charter so that under, underrepresented areas are getting, get more representation, then you can do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, we live in a democracy somewhat. Uh, people have the opportunity to petition the government and then and, and the charter was changed once, it could be changed. Again. It, that's, they, you know, the whole point of amendment is Change. We we have you have the authority to change the charter. The question is, is there the political will? And I think that's a more important question. Is there the political will? Because, like I said, it's no accident that some areas get their roads paid twice every year, and other areas have had their roads paved in twenty years. It's no accident that that's the way it is. You know, it it it's it's set up that way. And so, if you want to change those things, you have to activate that community 
and then push for those those changes. And that's why it's so important to vote. Uh, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Richard Danford, president of the Jacksonville Urban League and uh, have him say a few words. I was gonna wait until the end, but I thought he might like to respond to that question. Um, Richard? Well, not necessarily to that particular question. First of all, let me uh, commend all of you uh, for participating this evening. I tell you, uh, Dr. Botley, uh, you, you're, uh, you have an interesting, very positive delivery, you know, uh, very, very impressed. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm also, I continue to be impressed with the caliber of the, uh, the students over at Florida Coastal School of Law. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm just, uh, I continue to be, to be amazed, but you know, what is so important is, is that the urban leagues, um, I guess, uh, I won't say leadership, but the urban leagues desire uh, to serve the community. And, and we're, we're using, because of COVID obviously and the lack of connection, we're using this medium uh, more and more to inform the community. Uh, you mentioned education, how important education is. You know, Nelson Mandela said that, you know, education is the way, you know, really the only way that you can change the world. And so again, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really taking note to the Neighborhood Bill of Rights because, you know, we talk about the disparities that, uh, that exist in various neighborhoods for so, so many years, but yet there is a, an ordinance that's right in our faces that, uh, you know, that says in writing that citizens have an opportunity to participate in the budget process. Now, you know, and, and to participate and have a say on projects, things that they build, uh, you know, and, and it seems to me that the things that they're building are really in the downtown area. It's not that much building going on. In, in the Northwest Quadrant. Um, there's not a lot of, there's not too much going on other than fighting over some funding for a program, you know, that, uh, you know, it seems that we're going around in circles. So we've got, I guess we've got to follow the procedures to the resources in order to help our communities, whether that is through a CPAC, whether it's through your council member, or whether it's through the five at-large members. You know, so we have all of these members that are working for you in your district. And, uh, you know, we're expecting them, you know, to do a pretty good job for us and to put us first and, and put them second. You know, I'm talking about selfless leadership and we need more of that uh, in Jacksonville from the top down. You know, we talk a lot of noise over many, many years, but you see where we are rehashing the same things that we've talked about for many, many, many years. So let's use uh, a, a new beginning and a phoenix from the ashes here in 2021 to do what we can do to help our communities. Uh, thank you all so very much for joining us and I appreciate you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Michelle, I think there are a few more questions. Kaziah was um, taking over questions. I know I personally sent her a few that were taken off screen. So Kaziah, I'll let you take it back over. Yes. Um, so there were some that were sent off screen. Uh, one of the questions was, how do we continue to celebrate history beyond Black History Month? Uh, Black history in particular. Um, so I guess we can uh, handle that question first. 
Who is that to? I believe that was to the entire panel. Yeah, I think that was to everyone on the panel. Can I, let me, let me start. I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Danford for his one for it. I, I, I failed to mention the role that the Urban League played in Jacksonville's history also. But I, I, Steve Biko, the great South African freedom fighter, he had a quote that I, I often tell my class. It said, he said, the most effective tool in the mind of an oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And one of the things that I think is very important is what you don't tell a kid is what you tell a kid. And, and I, I start my classes off every year with the same thing. I said, you know, if you all didn't know, if I, if I take $500 under each chair and every day you came to class for a whole semester and then left, and I didn't tell you that there was $500 out of the chair, you would have spent that entire time in my class and not known that there were resources there. It's the same with education. When you talk about making this history part of the whole year, what the problem is, it's not what we tell kids, more, more so it's what we don't tell kids. We tell kids part of the story. The United States, you know, the founding father, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, but we don't mention Benjamin Banneker, who helped, you know, our, was the architect who helped shape Washington, develop Washington. We don't tell them about Christmas Attic, the first person to die in America's fight for freedom, a slave. So it's the things we don't tell that make American history so destructive so often to African Americans. Because oftentimes kids always tell me, all I know Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, Booker Washington, and there's so much more to our history than that. And you don't have to take away from the other stories just to add these stories. And so that's what you have to do. You have to make sure that you tell the whole story. And when you tell the whole story, you incorporate everyone. You make sure that everyone knows that their piece, their, their piece of this American fabric is just as important as everyone else's piece. That would be my answer to that question. Great, thank you. Um, Solomon, do you wanna try and tackle the question? I do, but I would like you to repeat it again, please. Yes, uh, the question was, how can we continue to celebrate Black history beyond Black History Month? Um, well, just going off of what Professor Bartley said, it comes down to what we're taught and what, we, what we're, what we decide to look into and what we decide to research. American history and black history, you can't, you can try to compartmentalize black history just within this month, with this, which is what uh, this country has done. But at the end of the day, American history isn't, black history is throughout American history without, without, African Americans in this country, this country would not be this country. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the things that we know that we consider when you when you think about America, the Capitol building, the White House, um, you know, all of these, all the leaders uh, that are in this country, all of all of them, and even our nation's capital was built off of the backs of African-Americans. Um, that's just a fact. And so to the real question or the real understanding should be how, uh, should be how does America begin to start to see the facts for the, the true facts for what they are instead of brushing over um, what is considered black history or just confining it to a month. Now, this is a great month to highlight these, these amazing people. I mean, Professor Bartley has named a whole bunch of people who uh, a lot of us don't know about. And that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Um, so how do we begin to get past that, it's by beginning to, to force incorporation of all of these people into our history books and not just generalizing the history for how the country wants to see it as 
far as you know mostly good and brush over the bad we have to acknowledge everything uh, when it comes to history the only way to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes is by learning learning from the bad and the good so it's about acknowledgement that's what it comes down to uh, if if there was a one word to to encompass that question it's acknowledgement we have to begin to do that not just as african americans but as a country as a whole <clears throat> And I would like to just piggyback off what Dr. Bartley and Solomon said. Um, first of all, in order to celebrate celebrate Black history, we have to know about it, which is why an event like this is so fundamental because we're bringing the information to you in an educational format. Now, had we been given the information from an early age, i.e. it being in our curriculum, we would have already had those fundamental information and we wouldn't have to revisit this, these topics or these historical facts now, but it's imperative for everyone that is on the call to actually listen attentively and to pay attention to all the information that is being brought forward. That way we, we continuously carry on a tradition by, as Dr. Bartley said, telling our kids that this is, what's, this is what happened here, not even only in Jacksonville, but everywhere else. Um, also, I know for my organization, we are doing social media events. Social media is the new in, in thing now. So whenever we have information, we plaster it on those formats, which broadens um, the distribution of black history as a, uh, you know, as knowledge. So with answering that, I'm just basically saying that we shouldn't have one specific month where we celebrate Black history. Black history, we should be the embodiment of Black history. We continuously make it every single day. So we should always be talking about it, always be telling someone something. I know I learn a lot because I'm you know, not originally from America. So whenever I learn something, I call my friends and I'm like, hey, did you know this? Yada, yada, yada. So that's how we continue to celebrate Black history every single day. 365 days of the year and not just in February by being Black history and just being a walking embodiment of it. And we had another question as well uh, from Jordan Bryant, uh, which says, do you think it's possible to petition for Jacksonville history to be incorporated into the local primary or middle school curriculums? most definitely uh you know i would encourage him to get my book in no way tired looking at the history of integrating the schools but the reason you have a school board is because local control you can do whatever you want if you can get control you know you I, you, you study what happened in in texas where they didn't like what their kids were being taught so they got control of the school board and they they made sure that they changed the curriculum African-American parents need to be the same way. You know, real quick, one of the, one of the things that inspires me to study African-American history is Shakespeare's play Othello. He uses the character Iago to make a very powerful statement. He says, the man who steals from me, my purse steals trash. Nothing was mine, was, was his to save a thousand. But the person who steals my good name robs me of that which does not increase, enrich him, but makes me poor indeed. What has happened is the, for African-Americans, our good name has been robbed from. And it's been robbed from us and it has not enriched anyone else. They, you know, they've told us lies about ourselves. And so if you want to fix the problem, get yourself elected the city to the school board and demand that we incorporate, that we make curricular changes. It's no accident that they allow local school districts to determine what local kids learn. It's no accident that in the South, you learn to appreciate certain things. And in the North, they learn to appreciate other things because they want to, you know, they have what they call community standards. Well, if you don't like those community standards, get elected to the school board and change those community standards. Make sure you that the community 
appreciates the role that African Americans play in education because your kids are part of that education. He, I, uh, Solomon said Jacksonville has about thirty percent African American in in the uh, in the community. Well, they should have a say in what their kids learn. We should be working hard every day to rebuild the good name of African Americans. And by rebuilding the good name of African Americans, it does not take away from the name of anyone else. It just tells the rest of the story. Thank and you for that. It comes down to it comes down to being involved and paying attention. So if you're not looking into what your city government's doing and you're not trying to stay informed about anything that's going on locally, um, but you're more, you're more in depth and uh, knowing of everything else that's going on around the country, that's not helping your community. Uh, everybody, when you think about elections, you think about just uh, presidential elections and Congress, which is important, but really your local elections are what count more towards immediate effect of how your living standards and how uh, your everyday life is. Um, we all have to start to be more informed about who the local leaders in our government are, because if we're not informed about who's leading and the process, then we can't hold them accountable. And the way you start to hold your city government accountable is yes, by you getting involved and possibly getting elected, but also by just staying informed and understanding the power of your vote. Uh, everybody has heard or even maybe been guilty of saying, oh, well, my, my vote doesn't matter and this and this and that, the process is just rigged and all of this stuff. Your vote does matter. Um, People have died so that you can vote. That's that's just the plain and simple, blunt understanding that you should have. People have sacrificed for you to be able to put that check on the ballot without recourse, and you need and it needs to be taken more seriously. But it comes down to that: getting involved. Well, um, any other questions before we close? It's getting on uh, 7.30 almost. Um, again, I wanna thank everyone, the panelists, uh, Professor Bartley, uh, Katrina, uh, Solomon, um, as, as uh, President Danford said, we're very impressed with uh, Florida Coastal students um, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for all of the effort they have made to help get the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice off the ground. Um, very grateful. I wanna close with um, a couple thoughts. One is uh, the, the, the uh, construction behind Professor Bartley, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge was built by the people of the Marin County and San Francisco uh, over the objections of many leaders. They paid a dollar a piece, one dollar each for bond, a dollar bonds to make that thing happen. So where there's a will, there's a way. And I think it underscores what um, Solomon and uh, Professor Bartley were saying. Um, it's really important to uh, not just have an idea, but to act on that on idea. And somebody said earlier today, in sort of a similar context, that um, stuff worth doing is not easy. And uh, on the other hand, if it was easy, it would be very boring. So um, that's what the Lord gave us, and we're going to. We're going to, uh, um, you know, deal with it, persevere, keep pushing. Where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I do notice that um, Kaziah just sent around the link to the 
survey. We encourage you all to uh, participate in our surveys. It helps us improve our efforts and uh, uh, just make for uh, better um, town halls in the future. So if you wouldn't mind doing that uh, after the program, thank you. The link is there. And you also get one by email. Um, any other comments before we close? Well, once again, thank you to Florida Coastal School of Law and the, the Black Law Students Association and all the things not only that they have helped us with, but what they're doing at the law school and throughout the city of Jacksonville and the city of Florida. And uh, again, thank you to the interns and the Dexville Urban League for making this possible. And we wish you all a great night. And uh, this a video of this will be going up on our YouTube channel and it's available um, soon uh, on the Facebook where it's been broadcast tonight. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you on our next um, uh, town hall, which, actually, which is actually tomorrow night on apprenticeships available for uh, individuals looking for um, uh, jobs that are in very high demand. So look forward to seeing you then. Uh, Take care, everyone. Yeah, Dennis, do you want to mention Friday noon? I mean, 12. Oh, Friday. yes, yes. Um, I'm going to start out the mention, but I'd like you to uh, uh, finish with that, Richard. In fact, you could uh, uh, that you could use that as our benediction, if you will. Um, we On Friday at 1230, we will have a, a veterans uh, health and wellness and healing uh, gathering both on Zoom and uh, in person, if, if you so desire, um, at 5, is it 531 Union Street, Richard? And, if, and with that, I'll, at the La Villa Center, and I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Yes, we are located at 531 Union, actually on the corner of Union and Broad. For those of you who are not familiar with the La Villa Center, uh, on the east side of our building, we have, uh, where we've created uh, the wall of, of honor, uh, service and patriotism for African-American veterans uh, from, well, throughout uh, our history from starting in 1812 to present. So if you get a chance, uh, swing by and, and, and take a look at it. And uh, if you want to zoom in on, on Friday uh, from 12.30 to one, uh, we will be there to make some comments. And of course, we're going to have the vet, uh, the vet center's uh, bus will be there to provide, uh, you know, whatever uh, services uh, to veterans that, that, may, that may need that. So yeah, that's on uh, 1230, 1230 to, to one on, on Friday. Also, in addition to that, uh, we'll have a quick memorial. We've had uh, several <clears throat> uh, veterans uh, to pass either through uh, COVID-19 uh, or in one case, uh, our very good friend, Dr. Aaron Gibbons, who retired from the Vet Center, uh, was fatally uh, killed um, a couple of weeks ago down in Orange Park in an accident. So uh, with that, uh, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to our next uh, town hall meeting. Yep, town hall soon. Thank you, Richard. Good night, everyone. Good night.